Greetings to all the students. Welcome to Biology and Chemistry Free Science Lessons. And our today's class is the chemistry class. And our today's topic is separating mixture techniques. And this topic is a very important topic. One of the very basic and easiest topic ever in our IGCSE chemistry. And this topic is important from class 6 to class 10 students. So let's, let's see what this topic is about. So first of all, what is a mixture? We all know that two or more substances when they're physically held, no chemical reaction is taking place in them. And you can easily separate them by using physical techniques. Such type of the substance is called mixture. For example, uh, like you can say sand and water, iron particles and sand. All right. Uh, so salt and water, sugar and water. So these are all the examples of the mixtures in which we can easily separate the different components. Now, what are the two types of mixtures? The two types of mixtures are number one, heterogeneous mixture. So what is a heterogeneous mixture? A mixture in which the two substances you are mixing or more than two substances which you are mixing, they never dissolve into each other. You can clearly see them floating or you can say there is a clear boundary of separation in between them. For example, if you put some sand in water, sand will never dissolve in water. You can see sand floating in the water, oil and water. Oil also, if you will put oil in water, you can see the layer of the oil in the water. So such type of the mixtures are called heterogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous mixtures, second type, what are homogeneous mixtures? These are actually the clear solutions. What is a solution? A solution is made up of a solute and a solvent. A solute is a substance which we dissolve in a solvent and we all know that water is a universal solvent and if you dissolve salt in water, sugar in water, they will completely dissolve in water and they make clear mixture. So this clear mixture is a solution and solutions are the, you can also call them homogeneous mixtures. Now we will see the different techniques. The, let's start with the heterogeneous mixtures, the mixtures in which the different components are not completely dissolved and you can see them floating into each other. The example is sand and water. So how sand and water can be separated? So you can see over here, we will make a cone of the filter paper. So the filter paper is a paper which is semi-permeable and it is available easily in the uh, school laboratory. So first of all, we will take a filter paper is usually cut in a circle. So we will first of all make it half. So it will become D shape. And then again, we will make it half. So it will become a cone shape, triangular shape. So we will make a cone of the filter paper. See, this yellow color is the cone of the filter paper and we have fixed it in a funnel. So this is the funnel. Funnel is easily we all have in our homes. We use funnels to put something in a uh, narrow bottles or containers. So we will take the cone of the filter paper. We will fix it in the funnel and we will keep the funnel over the uh, this conical flask. And then you will pour this mixture of here are the sand particles floating in water. So when you will put it over here, naturally sand will not pass through the microscopic pores of the filter paper. So sand will be collected in the filter paper, whereas water will pass through and water will be collected separately. So the sand which is collected in the filter paper is called residue. And after filtration, you are getting water which is called filtrate. So this is how easily at homes also we can filter the drinking water. When we boil water, we sometimes use cotton clothes uh, for filtration purpose so that the solid floating particles can be separated. So this is the same technique actually. We are separating so sand or any other floating bigger particles uh, easily using the filter paper from the laboratory. So this was the easiest technique. Now homogeneous mixture the mixture in which the solute is completely dissolved in the solvent. So solute is salt, solvent is water. So we have got clear salt solution. You dissolve some salt in a glass of water. You will see that it will completely make a crystal clear solution. There is no floating particles of salt. So how you will get the salts? You will not be able to see the salt. The salt completely disappears in water. If you will taste it, then you can understand that salt is there in the water. So there are different ways of uh, separating salt and water. They are evaporation, crystallization, and distillation using lipid condenser. So let's see one by one what they are. Evaporation is a very common sense thing. Uh, like if you will place a container 
evaporating dish and you have taken some salt water here. Here is the salt water. Keep on heating it over the flame until most of the water evaporates in the form of steam. Water turns into steam and water will evaporate. So this container is actually open. It is not, the mouth is not, there is no lid over here. It's open. So the water will evaporate. And at the end, the salt will be left behind in the container. If you dry up the entire water, salt will be left behind. But here, uh, in the previous case of uh, evaporation, you are getting salt after the evaporation of the entire water. The salt is obtained in the form of a powdery mass. But if we want the salt in the crystalline form, then what we are going to do? So we are doing the crystallization method. So you can see in the crystallization method here in the first step, we have dissolved some salt in water. So it will be completely dissolved. You are keeping the salt in evaporating dish over the flame and you are evaporating most of the water. Most of the water, but not the entire water. When most of the water will become evaporated and the solution becomes a very concentrated solution, then we will just simply cool it down. So you can see in step number three, when the solution will become very much concentrated, most of the water is evaporated, you can see some solid crystals in the base of the evaporating basin. So you will cool it down and over the filter paper, you will just, you know, take the entire thing over the filter paper and then the liquid will pass through and only the crystals of salt will be left behind. So basically this method we are doing because we want the, the salt in the crystalline form. We do not want to get the salt in the powder form. We want the salt in the crystalline form. So you do not have to evaporate the entire water. You have to keep some water. You have to evaporate most of the water. The solution becomes concentrated and then you will simply cool it down. So that is called crystallization. Now we will move to the uh, next method of separating salt from water. So in distillation, uh, in evaporation, we have seen that we will evaporate the entire water and we will get the salt in the powdery form. In crystallization, we have evaporated uh, most of the water and kept some of it to get the crystals of the salt. Now, the third one is that what if we want to collect the water separately and salt separately? We do not want to even lose the water. When, the, when water will be lost as a steam, it goes in the atmosphere. But if you want to collect the water as well, then what you will do? So you can see this picture. In this picture, we have seen that this is the round bottom flask. This is the round bottom flask, this one. Okay, so this is the round bottom flask. Its bottom is round. That's why you cannot keep it on the flat surface. It will roll down. So we have fixed it with an iron stand. Round bottom flask. And in the round bottom flask, you have taken salt solution you have closed the mouth of the round bottom flask and you have fixed the thermometer. Why? To see that the water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius, to see the temperature. So this round bottom flask is connected with a delivery tube. So you can see this is the delivery tube and all around the delivery tube, this glass tube which you are seeing is called Leibig condenser. Leibig condenser. So what does it mean? This delivery tube is passing from the middle of the Leibig condenser. So what is actually Leibig condenser? It is nothing but a glass tube. And over here, there is one opening and here there is another opening. So we will fix a pipe over here and this pipe will go to the tap. So we will open the tap and the water will start coming through this pipe and this water will be filled up in this tube, in this Leibig condenser. So water will gradually, slowly filled up. And at one time when the water will reach up to this level, so there is another tube. So water will out from this side, water will in from this side. So we will fix another pipe and the water will go away. Why we are doing this thing? We want to do, do this thing to keep this 
tiny thin capillary this glass tube which is inside we want to keep it cool if you will not fix the Liebig condenser what will happen the round bottom flask will become hot and the delivery tube is connected with the round bottom flask so that will also become equally hot so when water will turn into steam when water will pass through this delivery tube this delivery tube will be hot so water will evaporate from this side the steam so we are not going to collect water if we want to get the water separately we have to keep this much delivery tube cold so that water will evaporate and will condense back so we have fixed a Liebig condenser so what is a Liebig condenser it is a glass jacket which is fixed all around the delivery tube and in the Liebig condenser, there are two openings. One opening, which is at the lower height. From here, water will enter. The Liebig condenser will be full. And water will leave from the opening, which is at a greater height. So in this way, the, 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 this Liebig condenser will remain filled up with water. And... There is a fresh water supply all the time. Water is getting in and out. So there is a fresh water supply all the time. So the delivery tube is remain cold all the time so that the steam which is coming into this capillary, uh, delivery tube will be condensed. Another point, there is another question which was asked in the O-level exams long time back. Only once it was asked and then it was not asked again. Long time back. I even don't remember the year, which year it was asked. But I, I remember that it was asked that why it is necessary for the water to enter in the Liebig condenser from this side, the lower side. Why it is important that the water must enter from the lower side and must leave from the upper side. Why not the reverse thing? Why not water will enter from the upper side and leave from this side? If this was the case, suppose water is entering from the upper side, water will flow down and water will leave from here. As a result, only this much part of the Liebig condenser will be filled with water. This much part would have remained empty. We want the entire Liebig condenser, this glass tube, to remain full of water so we will allow the water to enter from the lower side so the water will be filled up in the entire Liebig condenser and when water will reach up to this end the upper end then the water will start going so in this way the Liebig condenser will remain full of fresh water all the time and you can see inside this is the delivery tube so the delivery tube is also surrounded by water so it will remain cold so the water will evaporate the water will turn into steam the water will pass through the delivery tube and water uh, sorry steam will pass through the delivery tube and it will condense into water and drop by drop the water will be collected in a, another container and you will see that the level is decreasing and at one time the entire water will evaporate and only salt will be left behind. If you will evaporate the entire water, salt will be obtained in the powdery form. And if you will leave little bit of water, make it very much concentrated and then, you know, take it out and cool it down, then you will get the water in the crystalline form. So this is called distillation using Liebig condenser and we have separated salt from the salt water, salt solution in this way. Now let's see. Uh, there is another mixture, a homogeneous mixture, which is called wine. And wine is a mixture of alcohol and water. Wine is a mixture of alcohol and water. Okay. So, uh, alcohol ethanol is there in the wine. So, how can you separate ethanol and water from the wine? So, this is called fractionating, fractional distillation. And this is the round bottom flask you can see. And in this round bottom flask, you have taken wine. So we have taken wine here. We have fixed it with an iron stand. We have to heat it. So there is a Bunsen burner. And this glass jacket, a vertical glass jacket, you can see this one is called the fractionating column. Inside the fractionating column, there are glass beads or marbles from top to bottom. 
so this fractionating column is packed from inside it is built in like you cannot open the thin glass uh, jacket and fill fill it up with the like you can do that also but this is built in in the uh, available in the laboratory so these are the glass beads or marbles all right now on the top you can see this is the thermometer to measure the temperature and then this is again connected with the limbic condenser because we want to condense whatever the vapors are coming here so alcohol ethanol its boiling point is 79 degrees celsius and water boils at 100 degrees celsius we will start heating so both alcohol and water will start evaporating it is not like that when the temperature will reach 200 degrees celsius then only water will evaporate no water even evaporates at room temperature water will boil at 100 degrees celsius so when you will start heating both alcohol and water will turn into vapors and they will pass through the fractionating column but alcohol is very much you know less denser than water so it can easily cross the glass beads and it can pass through the the vapors of the alcohol will pass through the uh, delivery tube which is surrounded by the limbic condenser and so the vapors will condense and drop by drop the liquid will be collected here so this is actually the pure alcohol you are collecting in a different container and we will keep our eyes on the thermometer when the temperature will reach to 79 degrees celsius for some time the temperature will become constant and when from 79 it goes to 79 point something you will turn off the heat it means by this temperature the entire alcohol is evaporated and is collected separately and only water is what will happen to water the water has also evaporated water is denser so it will condense on the glass beads and it will start falling back in the round bottom flask so we will see that little bit of water will be left behind and little bit of alcohol is collected separately so what is actually the purpose of the glass beads in the fractionating column the purpose of the glass beads in the fractionating column is to just to stop the water passing uh, through the fractionating column and we do not want water to be mixed up with the alcohol so we have filled the fractionating column this vertical glass jacket with glass beads so that water will be condensed over the glass beads and will fall back whereas alcohol can easily pass through because it is less denser and it will pass through the uh, uh, limbic condenser and it will be condensed and will be collected separately so by 79 degrees celsius when the temperature will reach the separation will be done and water will be left behind you will see little bit the the volume of the liquid will decrease so it means water is left behind in the round bottom flask and alcohol is collected separately the last technique is the chromatography and chromatography is the uh, important one it comes in the o level exam frequently so what is chromatography chromatography is actually the technique of separating different colors which are there in a dye for example you have got a black color ink you have got different color markers you want to know what are the different colors there in the uh, in one marker like in black color marker what different colors are there or you have got you have made a, a mixture of solution of or you have extracted the juice of grass so you have got chlorophyll green color chlorophyll and you want to know what are the different colors uh, present in this green color so what we are doing uh, this particular type of the paper which you can see here this white color paper which is uh, fixed with a clip this is called a chromatography paper so this is a chromatography paper which is nothing but the filter paper we can easily do it at a school when we have got the access of uh, the equipment so if we have the filter paper we will cut the filter paper in a rectangle shape and we will draw a line with pencil not with pen and this line is called a base line the base line is always drawn with pencil and this is a container in which we have taken a little bit of water so this is water actually and we have fixed the 
paper, uh, paper uh, before fixing the paper on this baseline, you have put few drops of the ink you have like orange color, green color, blue color, black color, few drops you have put over here. And then you have fixed it in the water, which is acting as a solvent and you will leave it for some time. So the chromatography paper will start absorbing the water and you can see that the chromatography paper has become wet up to this. After some time, the chromatography paper has wet up to this. So we will draw a line. We will take it out and we will draw the line over here with pencil and we will call it solvent front. So this is solvent front. This is the baseline. We have to use them in the calculation. And you will see when the water is moving up, water is being soaked up by the chromatography paper. And when the water is moving up, water is pushing the color drops, colored particles. So the, if there are different colors there in one ink, every color has got different density and every uh, color with a different density will move with different speed. So those which are lighter will move faster and they will reach up to a height. Those which are denser, they will move slowly and they will not go a certain height. So you can see from this orange color, yellow and orange color are separated. From the green color, you can see that uh, yellow and this is sky blue color is separated. Then from the navy blue color, this pink, dark blue and light blue is separated. Black color, you can see yellow, purple, dark blue, light blue, different colors. It means every ink, every color was a mixture of different color components. So when water is moving upward, water will hit the color particles and the different color particles are separated on the chromatography paper. Now, why the baseline has to be drawn with pencil? I told you that you always draw the baseline with pencil because otherwise, if you will draw it with pen, the water molecules which are moving up, they will hit this pen uh, marks also and there will be all, you know, uh, the colors will smudge. So this is the reason that the baseline has to be drawn with pencil so that the colors may not spread and hamper our uh, experiment. So this is how different colors are separated from the different color ink you can take, you can take chlorophyll, you can take different food colors to understand what are the different colors present in your food color. Now, in the O-level exam, we have to do a little bit of the calculation. And what is the calculation? That is called retardation factor and it is represented by RF. So how we will calculate the retardation factor? For example, we have to cal calculate the retardation factor of this yellow color, this yellow color. So we will take the paper out and we will dry it. We will keep it on a surface and then we will measure with the help of a ruler from the baseline till the solvent front line. What is this distance actually? What is this distance? How much is this distance? So you can see uh, zero to four centimeter, let's say. So the total distance is four cm from the baseline and the solvent front. And the distance which is covered by this yellow spot from baseline zero till how much? It's 1.1. 1.3 cm 1.3 cm so what will be the retardation factor the retardation factor of the yellow color will be you will divide the distance moved by the yellow color from the baseline divided by the total distance from the baseline to the solvent front centimeter and centimeter will be cancelled and your answer will be in decimal in this way, you can calculate the retardation factor of every color which has been separated. So it, the question can be asked in the exam, calculate the retardation factor of red color or orange color or yellow color. Then on the examination paper, you have to uh, put your ruler and you have to take the measurement, first of all, from baseline to the solvent front. So that is the total distance. And then you have to take the distance from uh, baseline to a particular color. So you will divide these two and then you will get the retardation factor RF value. So this was all about this chapter of separating mixtures. I hope you have understood and you have enjoyed the class. So that's all for today. See you in the next class. Bye-bye.